Hey everyone, I'm John Carvello, president of Stono Capital and Divestopedia. I am so thrilled to have with me Dan Cremons here. Uh, Dan is a former PE investor and CEO. He is the best-selling author of uh, his new book, Winning Moves, 105 Proven Ways to Create Value in Private Equity-Backed Companies. Uh, and now he is helping ambitious private equity companies or private equity backed companies accelerate their value creation. So Dan, welcome. I'm super excited to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Been looking yeah, forward. Yeah, for sure. Hey, we're just going to do a, uh, a little bit of housekeeping for everybody that's on the call. So uh, we're going to have about 10 minutes at the end of this uh, conversation. So 10 minutes before the top of the hour uh, for Q&A. So if you guys can use the Q&A dialogue box to put in all of your questions for Dan, that would be awesome. Uh, and then the other thing I'm going to do here is I'm just going to share Dan's contact information uh, in the chat box. So everybody has his LinkedIn uh, and his email. So let me just do this right here quickly. Uh, and then you'll also get a, uh, an, a link to his new book. So everybody go out and get his new book. I have a copy right here. Uh, it's called Winning Moves. Uh, and everybody needs to have this if you're interested in the topic. And obviously, because you're on this webinar, you must be interested in the topic. So, uh, Dan, again, you know, congrats on the book. Uh, you did an awesome job with this book. I, I was telling you before that I, I loved reading it and I wish I had it uh, when I was kind of going through you know, our process of rolling up a whole bunch of businesses. So uh, congrats on the book. Maybe, you. You know, maybe describe for me, like, why, why did you write this book? Why did you decide that this was a book that you wanted to kind of put out there? Yeah, there's a lot of context from my own career that led me to the realization that this book could have value in the world and be useful to people who have traveled, traveled a similar path uh, uh, as I have. I think if I were just to bottom line it, the the reason this book exists, the reason I wrote it is to help private equity investors and executives to create value in their portfolio companies more predictably, more consistently, and more reliably. There's a lot of things going on in the private equity sphere today that have brought this topic of value creation to the fore as being really important for investors and executives alike. And yet my experience, uh, having you know, spent my career in private equity and now working with a bunch of PE uh, firms and their companies, my experience has taught me that a lot of investors um, and executives um, have room to raise their game in this area. And this happens to be a topic that I think I have, you know, something hopefully marginally valuable to contribute to, um, to their, you know, getting incrementally better at driving value creation in their companies. Yeah. And I think one thing, and I know this is my own personal experience, like, you know, a lot of PE guys are great deal makers. Um, but maybe not necessarily like operators, right? So they're, they're good at buying businesses, they're good at selling businesses, they're good at kind of the financing and, and the, you know, financial engineering, but then you get into actual operations and, you know, kind of, you know, where the value creation actually happens. Uh, and I know, again, personally, that's maybe where I fell down in my own personal experience. Yeah, and I think, you know, for, for a while, private equity is, depending on how you define, when you define the inception of private equity, it's been around for decades. And I think for the first you know, handful of chapters or innings of private equity's existence, um, firms could get away with being really proficient at deal making and, and less proficient at how do we actually bring things to bear post closing once we own the companies to make them more successful. Um, I think that, you know, that, that the ability to, to do that and rely strictly on deal making and cost cutting and financial engineering to drive returns um, is. Uh, uh, firms just don't have the luxury of being able to lean on those things anymore exclusively to drive alpha in their company. So, you know, value creation um, and being able to proactively intentionally drive it once you own a business is, is come to the fore as just being, you know, a lot more important um, to success nowadays for investors and executives. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, the first thing I thought about when, when, you know, I kind of read the book is like, you know, this is targeted at the private equity firms, private equity backed companies, but it really is a great book for any. private equity firms in business. You cut out there a little bit at the end. Give me that. Yeah, again. sorry. I just wanted to say, well, you know, why, why I focused on private equity versus, uh, you know, just every business owner, because I mean, these are levers that any business owner can pull to, to drive value. Yeah, I think you're right to point out that if you are a B2B executive or somebody who's involved in the B2B world in some way, shape or form, there is value to be had in this book for you. 
irrespective of whether you're private equity owned or founder owned or you know growth equity owned or invested. So I think that is true. And um, the community, the audience that I'm most committed to serving is, are, are, is the audience that I know best. And that is private equity firms and their portfolio companies. So I've kind of put the center of the bullseye on that, knowing that there are people outside of that that could get some benefit from this as, as well. Okay, well, let me echo that because everybody can get benefit from this book. <laughs> Anybody that has a business that's running a business, um, you know, that, that sees you know, kind of the ultimate goal is creating wealth, creating value, can get value out of this book. So uh, and, again, congrats. I mean, you do an awesome I want to hook in, I want to hook into that with a, a quick point, which is that, um, you know, while I wrote this book with a private equity audience in mind, one of the things I've learned after having launched this book, just by feedback I'm getting from people, is that an audience that can especially get value from this book outside of the, the PE community are, uh, are companies that aspire to one day sell to PE. And understanding how private equity thinks, how they think about value creation, how they think about proactively driving value creation in their companies um, is useful to the extent that it can allow you to get, you know, get ahead of the game in, in building your business in such a way that it will be built for private equity exit. Yeah, that's an awesome point. You know, and, and anybody that can kind of get uh, and understand how private equity works, what they're looking for, you know, has a leg up. You know, a private equity firm that sees all of those, um, you know, as you call them, levers in place, uh, you know, the thought through how to create value is, you know, that's the ultimate goal for the private equity firm. So if you've already thought that through and are executing on it, you're definitely much more valuable for, uh, for, for that, that kind of scenario or that potential exit. Exactly. Yeah. Um, hey, so just quickly uh, turning to our audience, want to remind everybody that, you know, we're having Q&A at the end. So uh, in the chat box, why don't you let uh, let Dan know where some of the people on, on, the, on the call are, are at. So, you know, let me know if you're in Germany or if you're in the U.S. Just type in uh, and let us know that you're here with us. Come on, who's going to be the first brave soul to let us know? Okay, well, while they're doing that, let, let's, uh, let's, yeah, Cincinnati, that's awesome. That's you. <laughs> cool. Okay, so uh, let's talk about just kind of the deconstructing value creation. And I'm going to share, um, you know, the, I'm going to share uh, a slide that you had that just shows kind of these um, five levers that you talk about in the book here. So just one second. Okay, I can't find it right now. But let's talk about these five levers that you have in the book, Dan. Uh, and these are really kind of the levers that you uh, use to talk about how to create value. So let, let's just kind of circle in through those, please. Sure. And John, if it's cool with you, I'd like to even just take a quick step back and paint a bit of a backdrop as to why, why this conversation that we're having right now is, is more important now than it's ever been before for people in the PE community. Yeah, please, that'd be great. I think it'll set some valuable context for where you were going. So um, th there's, there's kind of a, a, a logical and quantitative view of what's going on in the PE world right now and then an anecdotal. And I want to give you just a little bit of, of each. And, and just by way of background, I've spent the last you know, 15 years of my career um, working in private equity. I've been an investor. I have been a CEO and a CXO in PE-backed companies. Um, so I've kind of seen the same private equity movie from a few different seats. And I've seen the evolution of the space over time. And so we just look at where are we today, a snapshot in time from a kind of a logical quantitative lens. Here are some of the facts. The supply of private equity capital out there, uh, dry powder as it's often called in, in, in the PE world, has grown at about a 15% uh, compounded annual growth rate over the last six years. So pretty, pretty robust growth in the supply of money that's investable. The demand for that capital among small mid-sized companies has grown at a lesser rate. And, and the best, you know, there's a few different ways to look at the demand for that capital, but I just, I've looked at you know, the growth in the number of small and mid-sized businesses over time, over that same period of time, those that are, you know, theoretically investable for private equity. And the growth in small and mid-sized companies in the U.S. specifically has been about one or two percent over that same period of time. So, you know, anyone that's taken an economics class before can kind of think about, you know, staggering growth in supply versus more constrained growth in the demand for that money from 
from small mid-sized companies means that prices are going to go up, valuations are going to go up. It also means the margin of error for uh, private equity investors has gone down as the price that they're having to pay for companies has gone up. So the net of all of this is, you know, gone are the days of being able to, you know, find deep value buys that other people can't find because there's just a lot of private equity firms trafficking in the space. Gone are, gone are the days of being able to lean on financial engineering to drive your returns. Those things can enhance returns, but they're not going to win the day and they're not going to generate sustainable alpha. So we are in the era where value creation is increasingly important to actually building a sustainable advantage in the private equity sphere. So that's kind of the, the quantitative view. And then the, you know, the, the anecdotal view, just to layer on top of that, that supports the idea that um, it's just really competitive out there right now in, in PE land. Um, I, I have a bunch of these anecdotes myself. I'm sure others that have played in this world have their own, you know, their own experiences as well. But the, the one that best illustrates it is I have a, had a client about a year and a half ago who I was working with, which um, the guy was a, a founder and CEO of, of a business that had recently sold to private equity. And he, his business was in, was in kind of a, an obscure little niche. It was not growing that quickly. It was kind of an unsexy industry. And he shared something with me that I will never forget. He said, uh, I get about one to two calls per week from private equity buyers, uh, from buyers wanting to buy my business. Mm -hmm. One to two calls per week. And that was like the, you know, the slap in the face to, to me to really recognize that we, we're just living in a dramatically different, more competitive era of private equity than um, that certainly I grew up in when I started in the, in the space 15 years ago. So this is all kind of circles back to this, this core idea of this book, which is that in order to generate advantage and alpha and outsize returns in this market, firms are having to rely on post-closing value creation to, uh, to deliver the win more and more. And so, you know, if we kind of dovetail this into the, the, the uh, question you posed, John, it begs the question of how do we do that? You know, how, how, how can we, how can we more predictably, more reliable, more reliably drive, drive value creation? And for me, the answer to this question, of course, is you know, long and multifaceted, but it starts with getting grounded in a really clear and simple view of what actually drives equity value in, in a company, whether you're PE backed or, or you know, founder backed or, or the like. Um, and so there's, you know, there's, if we really boil it down, there's five basic things. The, the yeah, and, and let me let me pull up the slide here because I think this will cool. uh, help kind of uh, navigate through our conversation. And just to add to what you were saying uh, there, Dan, uh, I also think that um, you know I also think, and, and maybe this is purely from a marketing perspective, but being able for a, a PE firm being able to go to um, you know an owner that they're going to partner with and say, hey, like we we know how to create value in the business. It's not just about bringing capital. You know, capital is so ubiquitous right now. That, that everybody has access to it. Um, but it's more about, you know, being a partner that can really drive value. And everybody talks about that second bite of the apple. So that's probably a real differentiator too for a lot of private equity firms that can not only, you know, talk about it, um, but actually demonstrate, um, you know, case studies of execution on it. No doubt, no doubt. And, you know, that, that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book is if, if this book can help private equity firms to get even 10% better at that, um, at articulating their approach to value creation and at actually having some proof points in their ability to deliver on that, that would in, in and of itself justify, you know, writing, writing the book. Um, so I think you're, I think you're spot on there. Yeah, that's great. And what so you have I've on this, this slide and, you know, kind of wanted to go through again, you know, your, I'm talking about some of them, if you mind. Yeah, so um, let me just break this down a little bit. So y'all can see this on, on the screen, but you know, at its core, if we really boil, boil this down, there's five basic ways to create equity value in, in a business. You can grow your revenue, can expand your, your margins, your EBITDA margins primarily. Um, you can do strategic acquisitions, you can pay down debt, and you can expand your multiple when you go to sell the business instead of selling it, you know, or it's, you know, whereas you bought it for eight times, you sell it at 10 times, that, that creates value. 
And so, you know, all roads lead back to, all value creation roads lead back to trying to impact one or more of these, these variables. Um, and I think there's a couple of things to just note around the edges of this. The first is, there are, of course, other ways to enhance equity value that aren't really covered in these five things. You, you, you know, buying better, buying intelligently, um, or buying, you know, uh, at, at a value can create equity value. Um, but buying into a market with some real tailwinds that are just going to provide, you know, kind of a rising tide that can enhance equity value. There's other things around the edges of these that can play into the enhancement of, of equity value in a PE backed business. But for all intents and purposes, let's just think of these as the five real levers that you have to pull in, in a deal. Um, the other thing that I, I want to just call to light here is these five things are interrelated. And, you know, the 101 level view of value creation is understanding these five things discreetly. And then like the 201 course in value creation is understanding the interplay and how these things interrelate and mutually reinforce among them. And let me just, let me give an example or two to highlight that. Um, and anybody who's built a financial model for an LBO before will kind of get this intuitively. But, it, you know, a higher revenue growth business, i.e. box number one here, is likely to have a higher probability of creating multiple expansion, i.e., you know, box number, number five. Um, Another example, you know, more revenue growth in a, in a business with high fixed costs and real operating leverage means you're going to have a much higher probability of expanding your margins in that business. Um, if you expand your margins, you know, number two, um, that's going to provide more free cash flow per, for paying down debt, number four. So these things interrelate. And one of the concepts I talk about in the book when it comes to choosing winning moves to deploy in the companies you're, you're working for or with is, you know, prioritize what I call the two first, the two, the two for ones here. To the extent that there's a winning move that can allow you to impact one, two, th or two three, even four of these levers, those naturally, um, you know, those naturally ought to get more consideration than, uh, than others. Let me talk about what's, what some of those are as we get into it, but yeah, for sure. And, and you know, the one uh, uh, for, for people that don't know, I, I was involved in a roll up of uh, energy services companies, um, you know, over a period of seven years. And, you know, we, we went into this and, and, you know, as I was reading this book, I really started to think, hey, I, like, I think we were good at at the purchase. I thought we did a decent job of buying businesses. Um, you know, I, I think we were okay at strategic acquisitions. Maybe we couldn't even be better after I had read your book and just thought about, you know, how things kind of play together. But we really didn't have a strategy for, you know, revenue growth, margin expansion. You know, we, we kind of, uh, you know, knew that paying down debt was, you know, a way to create uh, equity value. But, um, you know, th this book really solidified the fact that there was so much that we were missing out on, on the value creation side by not being methodical and really thought out in the process. So uh, again, I'm, I'm going to post uh, a link to Dan's book here because, you know, anybody that's on this, uh, you know, on this discussion, uh, you know, obviously will find a lot of value from this book. One thing I would just, you just sparked this, this for me, John, but one thing that um, I just want to toss in here is the, you know, as I think about the companies that I've worked with, the companies that have been in portfolios I've been involved in or uh, been an investor in, um, the majority of them lump into one of two buckets. One was the bucket you described, which are kind of buy and build strategies where we're really trying to build a business through acquisition. And what I, what I see oftentimes with companies like that is they, they often are led by people who are uh, business, you know, firms or, or companies or consolidation strategies like that are often led by deal makers. And where the, what they really nail, the, the you know, lever they really nail is strategic acquisitions and they get some multiple expansion in that. The struggle I've seen a lot among companies that fit this profile is how do we drive organic revenue growth? By contrast, uh, bucket number two or category number two of, of companies are those that um, have not really done strategic acquisitions historically. They don't really know, they don't know the playbook, they don't have those capabilities in house, and they've leaned primarily on organic growth to win the day and build their business. And so for those companies, they, um, they kind of have number one figured out, maybe number two figured out, but number three 
And by extension number five, given strategic acquisitions can fuel multiple expansion in a very real way, are just untapped for them. And so it's about you know, understanding where companies are, what their DNA is, and how do we bring some of these other levers to bear to help them build a more rounded uh, value creation strategy. Yeah, that's an interesting observation on the two kind of buckets that you talked about. Uh, quick question on just how you came about these and just the process for writing the book. I know um, that you've interviewed, um, you know, a lot of professionals in the space. So maybe give us a little bit of, of Kevin, an overview on, on how you, A, um, you know, the process of going through, you know, learning the best practices and these winning moves, as you call it. Uh, and then B, um, you know, maybe, maybe talk about uh, just, you know, why, why these five? Were there, were there other ones that you might have thought of and you, and you kind of contemplated? Should they be in? Should they be out? So maybe give us a little bit uh, of that. Here was the thought process uh, that really guided how I went about the book. Step number one was how do we take this, this really vague, big, and kind of nebulous idea of value creation and deconstruct it into its component parts such that we can approach it a bit more surgically? Um, and so, you know, I thought long and hard about this. I've, I, you know, had conversations with people and read things and, and kind of built my own mental model for, and I had a pre-existing mental model of this sort, but built my own mental model for what are the value creation levers? And then if we, I, I, which is what we're looking at here on the screen and uh, what sits beneath each of those. So if I kind of double click on revenue growth and apply this same way of thinking of how do we deconstruct revenue growth such that we can approach it a bit more surgically, similar exercise at, at that level. So what I was, you know, what I was left with was a, a model of sorts for here are the five basic ways to create equity value. There wasn't a lot that I left on the cutting room floor there given, you know, um, other than some of these peripheral factors I mentioned earlier, like, you know, buying at the right price and, and the like, the five ways to create equity value are pretty clear cut and largely indisputable. Um, so, uh, so I kind of had the model, I had the framework. And then the question, you know, I asked myself is, well, how can I actually, I, I don't want to write a book that's rich on framework and theory and light on practical application. So how yeah. can we crack each one of these boxes open and equip readers with an arsenal of what I went on to call winning moves that they can use to make each one of these boxes big? Um, and so in, in doing so, I really went to, to, to two or three places. The first is, you know, tapped into my own brain and went back through the experience I, experiences I've had and the things I've gotten wrong and the things I've seen done right. And just, you know, built out my own inventory of winning moves from things that have worked for me and um, that I've, I've learned over my career. And then second, and probably more powerfully, um, uh, I tapped into my network of you know, one of the things that, that my career has given me is just a, a, a deep and wide network of people who have done amazing things in the private equity space, both operators and investors alike. And so I went to 60 of them and spent, you know, dozens of hours of time interviewing them and mining their brains and their experience for the same thing, which are the winning moves that they've deployed against each of these five things that have most, you know, consistently in their career delivered, delivered equity value. Yeah, and I'm I'm humbled that uh, you you'd asked me. I'm not even sure how we kind of connected, but uh, I am humbled that you asked me for some of my experiences. And uh, you know, I, I found that um, you know really my expertise was on that strategic acquisitions, and there's lots that I can learn um, on you know all of the other four uh, value levers that are there. So you know, I'm, I'm really uh, again grateful that you asked me, and also really grateful for this uh, these learnings that you're presenting in this book. Yeah, I, for those in the audience who, um, uh, many of you who know John or know the work he's doing in the world can probably surmise this, but when, um, when it came to our conversation on strategic acquisitions, we have even bled into the multiple expansion that was part of your success story. Uh, it, you know, it was like a master class from, from, from a black belt on, uh, <laughs> on how to really nail each of those levers. So I'm, uh, I don't know I about learned that. A lot, learned that. A lot about I appreciate you, uh, you, you being uh, over-exaggerating there. So <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And the other thing that you, you provided another slide here that I'm going to share. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen um, and get into uh, maybe a little bit more on, let me just do this as I do this on the fly. Everybody can see that, I'm sure. Uh, you know, let, let me, let's talk about kind of like the, 
this idea of you have the levers and then you have value drivers for each lever and then you have winning moves, right? And, and again, the thing that I really love about your book is just how actionable uh, and how tangible the things are that people can do to create value, which I feel was missing in a lot of other theoretical kind of high level frameworks. So maybe, maybe talk about uh, that, the levers, value drivers and winning moves, like how those kind of uh, work together. Think of this as a bit of a, a like a nesting doll, if people are familiar with, with those things. Um, so, you know, the highest order here are these five things, five basic ways to create, create equity value in a business. If we then, and I call these the levers. It's not a term I made up, but, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a term that's often used in private equity land. Um, so we'll call these the levers. Then, you know, layer two of, of the nesting dolls is double clicking on one of these. So if you go, go to the next slide you should have, John, if we double click on revenue growth, we can, we can do this similar kind of exercise of deconstructing revenue growth into its component parts. And you know, at, at the end of the day, there's five or six basic ways to, to, to grow revenue. The first is to reduce your customer churn, which is more about rev revenue preservation than anything, but it's a way to, you know, to, um, to sustain revenue. The second is to sell more things to your current customers. We'll call that customer expansion. The third is to sell more uh, to, to new customers in your current markets, call that market penetration. The fourth is to expand into new markets and new markets can be defined a bunch of different ways, new segments, new geographies, new use cases. So we'll kind of define market expansion liberally to say anything that expands the addressable market for your current products. Um, the fourth one, or the fifth one rather, is you can uh, uh, build and sell new products, call that product expansion. And then the sixth is you can optimize your pricing um, for, for the same products. And so, you know, these are, this is kind of the second layer of the cake, if you will, is let's, let's go to revenue and let's kind of break it apart. And then the third, and here's where the real value comes in, is we can crack each one of these open. And the book does this, cracks each one of these, these growth drivers open and says, what is an arsenal or a set of proven, actionable winning moves, things you can go do in your business actionably to make each of these, each of these levers go? Um, and we can talk more about what some of those things are and, and you know, dig into these, but, um, but that's the basic framework. You kind of have your, 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 your levers, Underneath each of those, there's a set of value drivers, which you just went through for revenue. And then to make each one of those value drivers drive, um, it, br it brings in a question, what are the winning moves we can deploy to make that, make that happen? Yeah, and, and you know, I, think, I think a lot of people here on the, on the webinar today are probably financial minded. And, and I, I really love kind of you know, how logical and sequential this is, right? Where again, it goes from lever to uh, you know, use the analogy gives you all of these. So, um, you know, I just, I like how it's almost like a, a Bible of value creation if, if we want to go that, that, that way. Well, and, and, you know, for the financially, for the financially minded folks on the phone, um, which I can relate to, I, you know, I, I grew up as a finance guy. Um, the, this sort of logical approach is, is probably, you know, very natural to you. And, and a lot of financial models end up producing something like you see on the prior slide, a, a revenue bridge. Here are the different ways that we're going to drive revenue in this business. The problem for, for many uh, like that, and the problem for me early in my career is when it came to how do we actually, we, we have a number, you know, we have a number on each of those boxes of how, how, how you know, what, what amount of our revenue growth is going to come from retention and expansion. The problem was when you asked me, well, how are we actually going to go do those things? How are we going to make those numbers come true? For the first you know, chapter of my career, I was entirely flat footed on that because I had, you know, I had not studied the topic. I hadn't been around for long enough. I didn't really have the pattern recognition and I hadn't been an operator at that, at that stage of the game. And so, um, so you know, part of the intent of this book is, is for financially minded folks to, to help them take it that next step and say, how can we actually make each of these boxes go? What are things we can do? How can I partner with my my executive team and give them the, the, the best of my thinking on different moves we could make to, to make each of these, each of these boxes uh, uh, go.
Yeah. And I, I've advanced one of the slides here and, and there's a thing that you call meta levers. We'll talk about meta levers in a little bit, um, but maybe just give us an overview of the two meta levers that are here. It's kind of like a little preview to what we can about. Yeah, sure. And, and I hope, uh, I hope the audience at home is following along. Now, I get that there's, this is kind of a, there's a few different, you know, there's a, there's a, a framework we're working within here, but there's a few layers to it. So I'm at the risk of complicating things. I'm going to just going to add one more piece, which I call the meta levers. And, um, the book will help make this fit into the context of the overall scheme uh, much more clearly. But basically, these meta levers are, if I give you a little, little preview of the book, the first 60, 70 percent of it uh, by page count is really on what we've talked about already. How do we make you know, each of these, these uh, value drivers uh, uh, you know, ju juicy and, and help you make a lot of money? Um, and then the, the kind of mic drop moment <laughs> happens at about, you know, at about 70%. And this is where the meta levers come in. And basically the, the, the headline of this section called the meta levers is none of the rest of what we've covered up until this point matters a lick unless, unless you have a fit for purpose team that are executing these winning moves and executing your value creation strategy. And you are enveloping or wrapping them in a strong culture that's conducive to them being successful. So like, if you don't have those two things, then you can just kind of assume that the first 75% of the book is going to be worthless to you. <laughs> um, you know, at the risk of selling against my own, my own book, but it's to say, you know, if we don't, if we know that uh, just painting in, in examples here, if we know that a big part of our value creation strategy, a big part of an investment thesis or a, a, an operator's business strategy depends on product expansion, growing new, you know, building new products for, for, for our existing customers. But we don't have a team that's really fit for purpose. We've been really good at kind of improving incrementally our existing products. But when it comes to identifying new needs that customers have that we can build products for, when it comes to being innovative, we just don't really have that capability then guess what? Your product expansion strategy is not going to go very far. So, so this whole chapter, this whole part of the book called Meta Levers is about um, helping investors and executives to figure out based on what our value creation strategy is, what is the team that we need in place to make that happen? And what are the attributes of a culture that need to be present in order to help assure success against that value creation plan? Yeah, that's a great meta, uh, great overview of the meta levers, and we'll we'll touch on them um, in the last kind of portion of the the presentation here. But but even before that, um, like how do you you know you, you said that that maybe it's like you know margin expansion is where we want to focus our effort. H how do you get to the the point where you're creating the initial plan to create for this value creation strategy and execution. Like, you know, obviously you can't do 105 of the winning moves, right? You got to pick and choose, um, you know, based on what resources are available uh, and where you actually think the ones that'll work will, will be present for, for the opportunity. So, so how do you at the onset really create this value creation plan? Go back a slide here. I mean, this is the work I'm doing real time with client companies is specifically within the first 100 days uh, post acquisition. We are going from, um, in, in a lot of cases, a place where there just isn't a lot of clarity on where are we going to take this thing and how are we going to get there and who do we need a board to a place where, you know, at day 100, we have a value creation plan that spells out clarity on where are we trying to go and, and how are we going to get there and who do we need a board. And so just know that this, you know, this is what I'm about to share is kind of born of some, some very uh, real time, um, you know, experiences I'm having with, with clients. Basically, the way that we go about this is as follows. The first, uh, the first step is really to figure out, hey, based on the management team's understanding of where's the opportunity in the business and the investor's investment thesis, let's start to put some numbers in these boxes or at least start to stack rank these boxes to say, based on everything we know, based on the combined body of knowledge across those two groups, where do we think the biggest opportunity to drive, in this case, revenue growth is? And so, you know, I spend time with client companies, working them through some exercises that's intended to help us come up with some kind of rank order of these, which, which of these, these value drivers do we think are the juiciest to, to you know, least juicy? And then based on some, some simple analysis, how do, we, how do we begin to think about the numbers that we put into these boxes? 
Uh, and I skipped over a really important point, which um, where this conversation actually starts in a lot of cases is to, beginning with the end in mind of, okay, if, if we're sitting here in the first 100 days of the investment, the, the deal was just done, let's actually think ahead five years or seven years or whatever that time frame is for the, the current buyer, the current investor. And let's say, what does revenue need to look like at exit in order to, to hit their target returns and give them some margin of safety? So, you know, if, if revenue today is 50 million, then and investors have a certain return that they're looking for. You can do the math on that and say, hey, in order for us to be successful for our investors and, and for us, you know, revenue really needs to be 100 billion at the time of exit. So that just gives you a context uh, to work within and a number to be shooting for. And it's about reverse engineering by saying, okay, which combination of these levers is going to get us there? And there's some kind of analysis we can, can apply to that. And, then, and you'll so that, do that for each one of the levers. You'll go through all six lever or five levers and, and uh, kind of go through this exercise. That's right. That's right. And then the, you know, the second step, I'll just kind of quickly spin you through this because I think this is, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in, the, in the zone of just really practical stuff that hopefully this audience can use. Um, the second step is figuring out who owns each of these? And this is kind of a controversial topic in, with, with a lot of people. I don't know that I have the right or wrong answer on this, but my, my fairly strongly held view is that there is somebody that needs to own each of these value drivers. And what I hear oftentimes from clients, you know, is, well, when it comes to customer churn, like everybody's working for the customer. So we all, we're all accountable for customer churn, for minimizing customer churn. And while I really appreciate the spirit of that, that, that sense of shared accountability and customer focus, at the end of the day, I, you know, I always bring clients back to the idea that if, if a single person doesn't own it, then nobody owns it. So we got to get some names and some owners against these and know that they're going to have to work cross-functionally with other teams to make, make each, of these, uh, each of these things happen. That's the second step is ownership. The third step is Good figuring- on that, Sorry, cutting you off. Uh, so the ownership would be like one of the value drivers or would they have, you know, would you find that, that one person owns multiple value drivers or it depends on kind of the resources available within the firm? Uh, depends on the resources available. So typically reduce customer churn. The, the name that's gonna go next to that one is your, your CRO or your uh, head of customer success, your head of account management. So depending on how you define roles in the organization, it could look a little different. Um, whereas selling, you know, more logos to market penetration, which is go to market sales, um, that's typically going to be owned by a CRO, chief revenue officer, or chief sales officer, or head of sales. Um, so it kind of it depends a bit, and, and it's conceivable that, if not likely, that one person, in a lot of cases, your CRO and or your head of customer success could own a couple of these. Okay. The idea is just, you know, create clear accountability for who's going to own and drive each one of these. Really the second piece. And then the third piece is, what are all the things we could do to hit the number that's in each one of these boxes? Let's not talk about what we're going to do yet. Let's just talk about what we could do. And here there's a variety of inputs that can help you to build out that inventory. It's your own management experience and your own, you know, expertise if you're one of these functional leaders. It's bringing in people from the outside, which can include your investors who, you know, are going to have some pattern recognition around what works in each of these areas. Um, I also oftentimes bring in just outside functional experts that are relevant to each of these areas. Um, it can be, you know, there's a variety of sources of, of inputs to, uh, it can be employee input. One of the things we do in the first 100 is we run an employee, kind of a, a, a pretty robust employee survey that's aimed at helping to garner some of this thinking from the team around what are areas to make this, what ways we can make this company more valuable. So it's about, step three is about building out the inventory of things you could do. And then step four, and here's the challenging one for a lot of teams is how are we going to go from this list of things we could do to the ones we're going to do? And we're going to commit to doing it in a really focused and disciplined way because we can't do it all. And the more we try to do, the less we will actually get done. So there's kind of a prioritization exercise in, uh, in step four, which is, uh, which is difficult for a lot of teams, understandably. And then step five is how do we make this a plan with the, all the classic planning best practice of each thing has a clear owner, it's quantifiable, it's measurable, it's documented. Yeah. How do we make a plan? How do we get after that plan? Okay. No. And, and again, this is why everybody needs to get the book because 
you know, this, it goes through this whole methodology and there's something that you can definitely refer back to uh, on helping you. And of course, Dan also helps a lot of his clients. So do you work, um, a couple questions, could you do this before the, uh, you close the deal? Like, are you working with private equity, uh, you know, on, you know, companies that they put LOIs in and are in due diligence on, uh, or is it kind of like that hundred day after, after the fact? Such a good, such a good question and a bit of a softball question for me because I, okay. I feel very strongly that the earlier you get started on value creation planning, which is the term we'll apply to the stuff that I just described, the better off you are going to be. And so best practice is you're starting this process pre-closing. You're developing a V1 value creation plan pre-closing. And you're beginning to collaborate you know, across the deal team, the operating team, if there is an operating team at the private equity firm that's doing the deal and the management team on this pre-closing such that day one, you can start to hit the ground running. That doesn't happen in a lot of cases for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is resources, not the least of which is the deal can be intensive and occupy a lot of, you know, take up a lot of management time and um, not the least of which is just some, you know, kind of uh, la lack of, forethought or foresight among the teams around, hey, the faster we get started on this, the faster value is going to happen. Yeah. So there are some things that can get in the way. But I, the, the big message here for the folks on the phone is the earlier you can get started on this process, the better off you're going to be in a world where time is money in private equity land. Time is returns. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, I guess one of the other kind of restrictions is just access to the management team. Like before you close the deal, you might not have the input of, um, you know, the actual, as you mentioned, the owners of these, uh, you know, value drivers. So that, that could be a challenging one too. No doubt. And, you know, just to, uh, you know, be empathetic to that point, it's um, uh, for management teams that are going through an exit process. It's a, I mean, it's a lot of work. You know this, I know from your own experience, John, and I've been on the sell side before myself and it's a lot of work. And so the notion of picking our head up from all the things that need to get done to run the business and to get the deal done and think about where are we going to take this? It's just kind of unfathomable for a lot of teams, but, um, but do the best you can and do the best you can on, on trying to get some of management's attention on picking the heads up and looking out over the horizon and saying, well, let's just, let's, let's start talking about where do we want to take this thing together and how are we going to get there? Yeah, for sure. So I do want to take questions here uh, at, um, you know, 50 minutes after the hour here. So I uh, still don't have a lot of Q&A questions, you guys. Uh, thank you for sharing where you're at. Uh, there's a, a, definitely a global audience that's interested in this topic and, and rightfully so. Um, you know, put in your Q&A, we'll, we'll take those for the last 10 minutes. Um, but for the next eight minutes, I want to talk about um, again, these, these uh, meta drivers, right? We, you have uh, emphasized how important they are, not only today, but also through your book. Um, so the first one that, that I want to chat about, because it's super fuzzy to me, and, and it was while we were, you know, I was personally going through that roll up, um, and that's culture, right? Like, um, how do you address culture? How do you build culture? How do you um, like get people on board. Does the culture drive, you know, some of the value drivers or do the value drivers kind of try to shape what the culture is? Maybe give us, a, a, you know, your ideas around culture and how we tie this into the value creation process. Yeah. So, you know, culture of all the things in this book, culture is admittedly the squishiest for a lot of people. And it was, you know, it's been squishy for me at different junctures in my career as well. So I think the, the starting point for this conversation is what is culture? Um, you know, if I were just to give a, a little bit of a metaphor here, cult, you know, culture, culture is kind of like air where we all know it's around us. We, um, we know it's there. We know what it's, it feels like when it's not there or when it's polluted, because we can, we can feel it in our lungs. Um, but you can't really like put your finger on what it is and like, what, what is it doing? And what does it look like? It, you know, so culture is just kind of kind of squishy, and so for us left brainers, you know, like like me, you need something to to latch onto in terms of how to define that. And I think about culture very simply as the collection of attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that are the most prevalent in a company. The collection of attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that are most prevalent in a company. 
And so in order to figure out, well, what is the culture today? Never mind, you know, ways in which we might need to evolve that culture to get where we're trying to go. Slow down and observe and, and pay attention to the, uh, the behaviors are the most noticeable because you can just start to look at how are people behaving in the organization, but also the attitudes and beliefs, which take peeling back the onion a little bit to get to the heart of. But in a lot of companies, we see that there are some prevalent, albeit subconscious or unconscious attitudes and beliefs that guide how people show up, the actions they take and how they behave. And so that kind of takes, you know, that, that doesn't make culture as, as clear cut as a number on a spreadsheet for us less brainers, but it at least allows you to start deconstructing. What is it? And how do I, how do I figure out, you know, put my finger on what exactly it is in this environment? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, we, we had, I, I'm not to say that we didn't focus on culture, it's just we didn't really have a plan around how to build it. And, you know, I had found as we went through, um, you know, it really was just a collection of people, like the people that you brought on, um, you know, if they shared a common belief and you were able to kind of communicate the vision properly, then, you know, your culture kind of grew out of that, just kind of commonalities, people with shared goals, ambitions, vision. Um, and that's how our culture grew. Um, but do you find that, that culture is difficult when there is like lots of acquisitions? You're trying to bring like maybe multiple cultures into kind of this play. Do they, you know, how do you, how do you bring everybody on the same page under one new umbrella of cultures uh, in this maybe combined, uh, you know, combined entity? Aligning cultures across acquired companies, specifically in you know, buy and build type of strategies, is one of the biggest challenges you'll face in executing a buy and build strategy. Um, and I don't claim to have always gotten this, this right, but where I've kind of come to with this is number one, just recognizing that this is, this is um, one, of the most, uh, one of the most challenging and often neglected piece of uh, acquisition or M&A success. Number two, it's not easy. And number th number three, um, what you're really striving for is not a you know copy and paste of culture. Let's take the parent company culture, let's copy and paste and impose it upon acquired companies. But you're looking for cultural alignment, which I know is just kind of a little bit of a buzzy, nebulous, you know, but buzzwordy type thing. But it's about what are the ways in which our cultures. How do we first and foremost honor where the acquired company we we've, we've just purchased has come from? You know, and honor that, not try to rip and replace the elements of the culture that have really served them to date. Number two, let's, let's figure out what are ways in which we're more similar than different? What are the, what are the areas of alignment we can kind of latch on to? Um, and number three, what are the cultural growth edges that, that that company has, ways in which their culture may need to evolve in a way that either brings it into congruence with ours or in a way that just helps them to be more successful? that we need to make big points of emphasis as we think about where are we gonna take this thing together? And so, you know, for, for just to use an example to make it less, but a little more concrete, for companies that um, for whom, uh, you know, innovation, this, this is a, you know, a little bit of a cliche one, but for whom innovation have not been, innovation has not been a, a value historically. They've just kind of ridden the same product set for a long time. The big part of the thesis is well, we actually need to, to juice innovation in order to make this business really successful and durable. Then the question for the team is, um, what are things that we've done historically that we could leverage in the way of being more innovative? And number two, what are ways that we're just going to need to evolve both our capabilities and our culture in order to be more innovative? And I don't have necessarily a playbook of what are the eight things you do for innovation as much as just knowing that we need to answer that question as a team and then relying on the, you know, relying on the team to come to their own point of view on how do we need to evolve our, our culture to, to do that. Yeah, so being really intentional about it and thinking, you know, where is it that we need to, um, you know, get people on board or get people kind of really focusing on this and, and how do we do it. So um, I, I like that. I like that advice that you're providing. And John, uh, you used a word there that I just want to like double underscore, which is intentional. Uh, oftentimes I have seen this idea I, and I should say to give credit where credit is due, there are companies I've, I've worked with and observed and learned from that have been incredibly intentional about culture and it shows and it pays. Um, and then there's, there's a lot of companies as well, uh, many of whom I've, I've seen as well, that um, 
are, are just not very intentional about it. Where, where a conversation about core values is perceived to be more of a rubber stamp kind of thing. Let's just come up with some things. Let's slap them on the break room wall. Let's put a poster around it and let's never talk about them again. I'm, I'm being a little dramatic for, you know, intentionally, but um, it's a little bit more of that than let's actually think, sit down as a leadership team. And let's, let's, you know, let's give a fair shake to this question of what are the attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that define us today? And then what are the ones that, what are the ways in which we're going to need to evolve in order to get to this next horizon we're going to? A level of intentionality there, as you said, can really, can really pay off. Great points. Let's, uh, let's spend like three minutes and then we'll take some questions. So cool. if you do have questions, let's put them into the Q&A box, please. Um, so there was a quote in, by Steve Schwartzman in your book, uh, and it says, after an exhaustive study of our database of dozens of deals across 20 years, we concluded that the keys to success in private equity are buying right, having an A management team and selling right. Everything else is just a conversation. I, re I really love that quote because it's, you know, just brings to the simplicity of how to drive value. But that management team piece, um, you know, is, is um, one of your meta levers, right? It's, it's people. So how do you get the right, and this might be a longer than three minute uh, answer, but, but how do you get the right people on the bus in the right seats uh, when you're trying to figure out this value creation piece? All right, I'll give you the I'll give you the ninety second version of that. But before I do, I just have to really drive this this point home. And this may be self evident to many many of the people in the audience, but um, the importance of getting this this right. And and I'd, I'd say two things maybe to lead off here. First is um, there was a study that was done by Alex Partners in I think it was twenty twenty, where for the first time in the history, the many year history of the study both investors and operators alike agreed that the number one predictor of a strong portfolio exit is a strong leadership team. The number one predictor. And I have all sorts of experience from my time in, in a very people-focused private equity group that would support that getting this right is foundational to everything that follows. And uh, there, there's an old mentor of mine that had this quote that has stuck with me for such a long time in a, in a really powerful way. And it really brings us back to the basics of what a business is. He said, at its core, a business is nothing more than people working with other people to do stuff for people. So businesses aren't products. Businesses aren't, you know, P and L's. Businesses are just a bunch of people in an office or on a Zoom together doing stuff for other people. And so if you don't, you know, people is kind of the atomic particle that makes up the organism of a business. So if you're not, if you're not paying attention to the atomic particle in, in that way, then the rest of the stuff, you know, is, 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 um, you know, is, is really not going to work. So I, you know, I just underscore the importance of this to your question of how do you get this right? Here's my, here's my basic, there's a lot to talk about here. The book gets into some of it. Here's my basic thought process, kind of three or four steps to it. The first is start with your thesis, Never mind the people, Start with your thesis. Where, what is the investment thesis for the business? Where will, will growth happen? Where will value come from? Step number one. Step number two is you know, breaking it down in the way that we do in the book of what are the key drivers of that? You know, it's, uh, we're really banking on improving customer retention, you know, selling to new logos, and then some product expansion to win the day. Okay, great. Step number three is what skills and experience do we need to have in the business in order to nail those levers? What, what, what skills, experience, competencies, expertise do we need to have in the business to nail those levers? And then step four is asking the question of, well, do we have the right people with those skills, competencies, and experience? And are they organized in the right way? And oftentimes just kind of walking, you know, I take teams through this, this simple thought process and we do, do so in a bit with a bit more rigor than I just outlined, but going through that thought process leads you to the conclusion that um, there are gaps uh, between the things that we've agreed are important to success and the capabilities that we actually have in the business. Yeah, so that's that, that opens up a whole new, you know, whole, a whole another uh, line of thinking and action around how do we how do we fill those gaps in the right way? Yeah, so that, that's awesome. So you're not only thinking about, okay, what levers are we focusing on? You're also thinking about, okay, what are the winning moves that are going to help us drive those levers? Uh, and then on top of that is like, okay, do we have the people to actually execute it? And if we don't, what's the strategy around that? that right. That's all. I love that. Right. Um, okay, so let's jump into some questions here. We have some great ones. Um, so any high-level thoughts on 
you know, of the five levers, which one is one that generally provides the most value lift? Mm. Uh, yes. So go. So I studied this. There's a bunch of research um, that I, I've gone through on this. Um, the, the research seems to suggest um, that in the, in the most recent, so I'll say two things. The first is revenue, for the reasons we talked about at the top of the call, revenue growth nowadays is responsible for an increasing and significant amount of equity value creation. That's for a few reasons, not the least of which is uh, accelerating revenue growth makes some of the other, the other four things happen. If you get more revenue growth, you can see some natural margin expansion. You're going to see a higher exit multiple. You're going to have more free cash flow to pay down debt. So revenue growth is, is in a way that, in a way that kind of king or queen of, you know, the, the, the levers. The other and one I'll, that I'll I- will add to that really quickly too, like on the, on the sale, like if, if you go to sell a business that has, you know, double digit revenue growth year over year, uh, it just becomes a lot easier to sell because there's more parties at the table, uh, probably a competitive auction. So. Uh, no doubt. To the, uh, the added value there. Right. Right. Um, I just lost you for a second, but. Yeah, up there. There you go. What was that last point, John? I was just saying that you know it's uh, you know it adds to the selling well piece, right? Uh, exactly. You know. Exactly. I mean, the you other thing that it is, is worth just mentioning is in the the recent years, um, multiple expansion has played a big role in private equity returns. The uh, average. You can cut this up in a bunch of different ways, but you know, at a high level, the average uh, the exit multiple or, or valuation for companies have grown by about a 5% CAGR over the last six years. And so if you do nothing else, if you do nothing else in your business, you'll get you know, 5%, uh, you know, 5 multiple expansion lift per year just naturally. I don't believe that's sustainable. So you know, firms can't just ride that rising tide into perpetuity, but there are some things we cover in the book it can allow you to take multiple expansion into your own hands and not just rely on the market, you know, natural multiple expansion that's happened in the last five years to, to help you win the day. Yeah, well, that's great. Uh, here's another really good question and probably maybe deserves an entire book around it. I'm sure there are some books, but how do you create an effective incentive plan to reward kind of execution? Effective incentive plan. I, you know, I don't know that I'm going to have any super novel wisdom on this other than the fact that for the people that are steering the ship, the value creation ship, getting them incented in such a way that gives them a piece of the win is a really important part of this. And that's not a new, I mean, that, that concept has been around for a long time and private equity of just aligning incentives in that way. Um, but, you know, do, doing that is, is pretty commonplace in private equity land. Not doing that can be a big inhibitor to to value creation success for all the obvious reasons. There's a bunch of things to talk about underneath of that or what are, you know, what are different market standard ways of incenting management. And that's probably a whole separate conversation. But I think you know, the concept of aligning interests, investor interests and management interests is, is really important. Uh, okay, here's another question. I'm gonna paraphrase a bit, but do you have any like stats or research tracking the success with cultural alignment um, you know, between kind of this value creation idea? Yeah, there's, there's, um, I'm trying to read this, read the question here real time, but it, you know, if, if the question is really around the connection between culture and value creation, there's a, uh, I went through some of the research on this and the best study on this comes out of Queens University. I talk about it in the book and they, they, they did a, I think a eight to 10 year study where they kind of codified cultural attributes in different companies and they saw how those cultural attributes changed over time. And they also tracked the performance of those companies. They were able to establish some attribution of what, um, of, of the linkage between culture and, and performance. And basically the, the punchline of the, the survey is that there is a strong demonstrable linkage between um, attributes that tend to be predictive of cultural strength and investment performance. And so there's more detail on, in, in this on the book. But, um, but that kind of research, plus just my own anecdotal experience of, you know, I've worked with a bunch of companies over, over time and 
those that are actually intentional about culture tend to do better, no surprise. Um, and so it's both the qualitative and just kind of the experiential would lead me to the conclusion that, yeah, they, I mean, there's high correlation causation between these two factors. Yeah. Well, hey, we're, we're up against the hour here. Dan, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, your book is awesome. I've just put a link in the chat for everybody to go and grab a copy. Uh, you know, we, 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 I think, I think we did a really good job of, of kind of diving into the book, but definitely the book gives, um, you know, much, much more depth uh, on this topic. Um, so Dan, thank you again. I am super grateful for what you've done for, you know, kind of this private equity community and just the value creation community in general. So uh, great work. And uh, I look forward to connecting with you again. John, thanks so much, man, not only for um, hosting us today and, and bringing me into this, but also just for the work that you're doing in the world. I, I find in you a uh, kindred spirit and somebody who's committed to serving this community. So I, I, I love what you're doing. And thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Have an amazing day. Bye, everybody.